Raj Warrior and welcome to another edition of the Car Guide. This time we are close to Düsseldorf and we are attending a technical workshop organized by Porsche. Uh, the workshop takes us through various aspects of the Cayenne. Um, over the next few uh, minutes you will see what exactly we have been through and a few of the workshops that we are going to address. Now onto the dimensions. The new design offers better functionality as well. The new Cayenne is 6 cm longer, about 1 cm fatter than its predecessor. The wheels are also enlarged. The Cayenne and Cayenne S as a standard get 19-inch wheels. The wheel diameters were increased from 550 to 570 millimeters. The package is completed by an electromechanical rear axle steering. Like in the 911, it increases driving stability at high speeds and lowers the turning radius at low speeds. Handling on curvy roads is improved and maneuvering is also becomes simpler. V8 twin turbo engine outputs 550 HP and has a torque of 760 Newton meters onto the crankshaft, which is 30 HP more and 20 Newton meters more than the previous model. Using large control, that acceleration is done in only 3.9 seconds from 0 to 100 kilometers, and its top speed is 286 kilometers per hour. And of course, in the new Cayenne, you have all the choices available to configure the displays as you like and want them. For example, you can configure this screen to provide you in one area, for example, with additional information here, as you can see. For example, the current music you're playing on your audio or the playlist can be displayed and then here Oh, vehicle settings can be superimposed and you have what we call the home button, the home function, which means it's much like a smartphone, it is freely for you to be configured to your preferences and likes and with the functions you want to see on your home button or on your home screen. There you go. We've tried to provide for that on the slides. Everything is done by the so-called touch operation. Let's just summarize to say the number of options have been clearly limited and focused. So everything you just saw is already now part and parcel of your standard, of your default setting. Only the sound possibilities and options, whether you want to have Burmester or Bose, that can be chosen at will. Let's start with navigation. If you use your PCM to calculate a route, that will be done completely online. You will see, it's a lot faster. Online route navigation and calculation will provide you with all traffic information, real-time traffic, all roadblocks and the likes. That's very helpful. Afterwards, we will also look at the One Connect app because if you start a route calculation on that app, it also is done online and you will get the same route whether you do it on the PCM or in your app. So push to talk button. Let's see, Will, and let's just try one function. I'll probably have to go away because I'm too loud. That I'm cold. I'm freezing. There you go, I'm freezing. Oh, lovely. It'll get warmer soon, she says. So, with the climate control, the climate control will go up by two degrees. The same, of course, will happen if I say, oh, I'm hot. It'll cool down. Let's try another function. What's the weather going to be like in Hamburg? So I asked all about the weather in Hamburg and as you can see the weather is displayed automatically. So something that of course you're probably familiar from the Panamera already, but here it's now. As you can see, actuated, activated with this connected speech information. You have vehicle functions as well as media functions all brought together in one app. So you no longer need two apps, but it's all coming together into one. The highlight of this new app is you can have your vehicle model in the color and with the options that really match your very individual car. So you can 
check your vehicle status, for example, the range of the petrol left in the tank, or the status of the doors, the windows are they open, are they closed, or thereby also, of course, to close or to open the car remotely. With the new One Connect app, we also will support Apple Watch, which means once you've reached the destination, for example, not yet the restaurant, but you're just parking a car, the Apple Watch will automatically, your smartphone, then route you to the last mile, or should I say the last few yards to take you to that restaurant that you've picked up front. And as you can see, the standard really comes with LED headlights. Then it comes with a warn and brake assist, including a predictive pedestrian detection or protection, as it says here. Then we've, of course, got the cruise control, including the speed limiter, and we will offer the park assist with ultra sound sensors in front and rear soon. As an option, of course, you can pick and choose from a wide range of additional options. For example, the LED matrix headlights, including the PDLS plus function, then as you can read, we've got the night vision assist, the lane change assist, the lane keep assist, including traffic sign detection and recognition, a park and garage pilot that will allow you to have the car piloted, steered into a tight parking space. How will we do that? How will we implement all these functions? Well, you can see it here. We need a real abundance of sensors to detect what happens around us. It's, for example, the ultrasonic sensors in the rear, or ultrasound sensors here, that's supplemented by the four cameras that provide us with a real top view, with the aerial bird's eye view, giving you a 360 degree perspective around the car. Then, of course, we've got radar in the rear and on the left and the right that once more mirrored, so you have it also as the front radar, left and right. Then we've got the mono front camera that detects anything up front and of course on top of that the long range radar right at the very front of the grill. And all these sensors, all the data from these sensors will be brought together, synchronized in one central computation area and here we can fuse map data, object data and infrastructure data and one central control unit, one CPU or ECU as it's called here that has been designed on a modular architecture will be able to handle all this data and here of course what's important we have separated application from the hardware so in future that system is really forward-looking and can be supplemented with further and future possibilities. Again you mentioned uh, a, a lot of semi-autonomous features uh, and said future for the future the system is uh, rigged so that you can move to the future. Um, and somewhere in the presentation there was this thing of now lane keep which is between 65 and 200. Does it actually uh, take the car along with the curves of the road or uh, is it limited in any measure in terms of the radii? Uh, there are two different uh, types of lane keeping. There's the lane keeping that keeps you on the street so it's not always steering the car only if uh, the car is um, in danger to, to leave the street. So it's, it's an emergency system. And uh, the second is an active uh, lane keeping that's always uh, available and uh, it keeps you in the middle of the street and of course uh, it's possible to drive curves and so on uh, with a limited uh, radius of the curve. So if you're in the Alps, <coughs> that's not uh, our target. Uh, this system addresses uh, highways or uh, big roads. Uh, but at w w are you working towards a stage where it will be fully autonomous in, let's say, in the next couple of years? Fully autonomous, uh, yes, in the next years, but uh, that's a long time story and uh, it won't, won't be available uh, next year. I'm Christoph Bittner, Dr. Christoph Bittner, and I'm responsible for steering systems and my colleague, Matthias Leber, also doctor. He is, as you probably will know, responsible for the brake system. That's his brief at Porsche. So, let's go straight into the heart of the matter. What's characteristic for Porsche cars? Well, as you know, as far as their driving dynamics and properties are concerned, 
You can see that's the four pillars that we try to achieve for all four cars and one whole true volume right through from the 911 to the KM. And what customers keep appreciating with our cars, you get at most an optimum of driving dynamics and steering precision, generated of course from our high performance chassis steering and all wheel drive systems. And of course the combination of all that. So, our total vehicle concept is based on a three stage concept and let's start with the first, that's the total vehicle concept and here, as you can see, here we so say, lay the groundwork and if that's not right, any further measures we take on the chassis side are hard to make sure you get the right performance. So. Rigidity, stiffness is important, but of course also the seating position of the driver is important. And then of course, of course the steering wheel, how the pedals are arranged. You knew, we use, and I think that's already been mentioned, we use a group platform, a Volkswagen group platform, and from that group platform we take over quite a number of components, for example, the front and rear axle concept, or the basics thereof, and a very important aspect is of course also the stiffness, the rigidity of the body. The underpinnings we have in the car are mainly carryover parts from the group, but where we are clearly set apart is when you look at the driving dynamic properties, both on the application side, but also by adding new features, we set ourselves quite apart. Unlike the platforms, we've got a hang-on all-wheel drive. That's not what you will find in Volkswagen Group throughout, which means, of course, the main thrust goes to the rear axle and the front axle will be activated, demand-driven. It's a permanent all-wheel drive system, but it's therefore dependent on the driving situation. What's new in the KM, which you probably also know from Panamera, we've got a three-chamber air suspension. That's also something that is not to be given in the group. Then also very new in the KM is, like in all our other vehicles, starting with 911, with the box top of the Panamera, you now also will find it in the, Pan in the KM, the mixed tires, different tires, front and rear axle, which gives us the key advantage that the front tires can be set to different parameters than the rear axle tires. Then we use our own Porsche brake construction kit, no carryover from the group, with our own brake calipers, both front and rear, and also coming with a new feature that we'll tell you in a second more about. Axle concept, as I said, essentially a carryover element from the group. It's a new front axle development with a multi-link suspension. So you can see here, lower section, so not a classic double wishbone anymore. What we thereby are able to achieve is a very responsive axle that is highly precise, very exact, and that gives you great feedback and also, of course, great straight lines steering when you drive the car, special brake pads. And you have a look at this clip. It looks a bit like Star Wars with this laser sword. You can see the rotating disc now being treated. That's the tungsten carbon process being applied onto the grey cast substructure. With this process, you have a surface hardness, as you can see, of well over 1000 HV. Which I think that's on the level of a diamond, isn't that right? Yes, no, it's actually above. It's above the level of a diamond, the hardness of a diamond. So you could, well, do something with it. I'm Frank Sitzler. I'm Marcus Sitzler. I'm responsible for periphery elements in the new KN engine, and I will get started straight away by looking at our power packs, because we're talking here essentially about three engines. Two V6 engines, uh, the Mono Turbo for the entry model, the 2.9 twin turbo for the V6, and of course we've got 4 litre V8 twin turbo for our top model, the Ken Turbo. All this, of course, requires a high performance cooling system, and that is, of course, uh, dependent on having a switchable water pump. 
which needs to be powered here, as it says, by something that is driven here by the intermediate half. And of course, we've got a map controlled thermostat inside that considers the driving situation and driving conditions to control the coolant and the flow of the coolant. Another key element to have an efficient engine is, of course, to bring down any frictions. And you see here once more how we have managed to reduce these friction losses. We've got the um, controllable piston spray nozzles, then the cylinder linings with their coating, their plasma coating, and with the corresponding piston ring tunings. And uh, as I just showed you, the water pump, the controlled water pump, together with a thermostat. But of course, we also adjusted uh, the gear chain timings and a much more efficient and simplified belt drive to have at the end of the day a very low friction engine oil that we use to simply bring down friction losses. The measures that gets us, as you can see here, to a substantially lower consumption of fuel. Best point, 228 grams per kilowatt hour output and under full load we are, as you can see, at 180 grams if you really are driving at full throttle, put metal to the pedal, that's the maximum. Well, it is possible, as you will see. We've got two different powertrains for the six cylinder engines and for the eight cylinder engines. Of course, both providing different torques, so therefore we've got the different transmissions. Here, in this case, the eight speed automatic, but as you can see, this one with an integrated front axle diff. So far that had been positioned outside the transmission, but now it is integrated into the transmission. And you can see here the spread is up to 7.8, the gear ratio. And that of course means that both performance and efficiency have once more improved, allowing us to have a torque capacity of up to 1100 Newton meters. And unlike the other models, we have the classic Bandler torque converter because we believe this vehicle with a considerable weight and trailing capacity and the off road performance should quite deliberately offer you, well, the capacity of the hydraulic converter. We think that's the best way of providing this different capacities. So, well, what are the objectives of our new body? Obviously, you have to meet the latest crash requirements. If I would have continued to build this in steel, obviously, we would have had such a weight problem because the weight spiral, as we call it, is simply a given as we build more and more. So we have to reverse it and have to counteract and become, well, in some way, find means to compensate for added options to carry weight and therefore shed weight with the body. What we've done now with the KN E3 is a multi-material mix, which means it's not just the hang-on parts that are made from aluminum, like the roof, but also inside the structure, the load-bearing structure, you will find now aluminum. Those parts that are firmly connected to each other are and come in a host of different materials. You can see we've got... So let's start, let's start with the platform itself, which can be split up into front, middle and rear end. And again, from the color coding, you can see what comes in which material. The aluminium in green. Uh, well, slightly lower number of aluminium parts here, because of course plenty of crash collision criteria need to be met here in a platform architecture. So for example, the cross beams mainly built in steel. And here the front cross beams also that's particularly rigid, ultra-high tensile, hot rolled steel sheet elements in that 
bright pink. Of course, the whole thing has been designed for the steel or for the air spring, which have, of course, different load requirements. And, of course, I have to provide a layout for the all-wheel drive, as you can imagine. So there's slightly different layouts for the platform. What is particularly challenging, of course, with this multi-material mix is, well, the galvanic separation. For corrosion res resistance, you, of course, have to make sure that you don't bring contact, I don't bring metal sheet with aluminium in contact. And therefore, I've got glue, I've got an adhesive element in between to insulate the two to prevent corrosion. Or, for example, I've got a wash plate or any other means that you could put in between just to make sure there is a galvanic separation between aluminium and sheet. Of course, that's a must given, otherwise you'll have instantly well, contact corrosion forming very quickly. Here, side panel, the exterior, the skin, a very big, it's one of the biggest pressed parts we find in the car, one form. And of course, as you can see, you see the design already with very deep drawing depths here, 240 millimeters at the rear, as you can see. 240 millimeters here at the rear fender. That's quite a sizable drawing down. That's quite challenging to build, but we want to achieve here surface qualities that we already had with the sheet steel, which is a lot harder with aluminium. And of course, by the same token, you want to have the sharpest possible ready, always as close to what you were able to create in steel. And that is a challenge to achieve this. And if you look at the cars on the market, you will note that many of these ready are rather bigger with aluminium than with the steel. Not always um, uh, well, a contribution to beauty, but we here, we want to have very precise edges and very sharp ready, and therefore that is a material challenge. Pretty demanding and challenging is the different thermal expansion properties of the materials. I mean, as you can imagine, you've got varnish on top, and you've got aluminium, you've got steel, they all expand differently under thermal influences. And uh, you've got, as I say, different coatings. I mean, we, for example, keep them immersed to 20 minutes at 180 degrees. And of course, as you know, aluminium expands more than steel, different expansion coefficient. And if I don't watch out, I have, well, yeah, problems with my joints. They expand differently. And therefore, I have to counter this by, well, specific joining technologies or tweaking my material or by which other means with paint for example with coatings so that in a way you have a body as you can see it here behind us that is pretty seamless to look at and also will react accordingly and you don't have any well oblique warps or whatever and of course the tailgate needs to be a perfect fit in the rear at, at the end of the day the joints are what they should be capable of holding and withstanding any potential loads working on them. 392 is the total weight of the body in white without, of course, doors and without the bonnet and without the tailgate and not counting the paint, which is roughly 20 kilos for this kind of car. Just to paint coatings. Aluminium share is 47%. In the outgoing model, it was pretty low, roughly just tailgate and the bonnet was aluminium, everything else was made from steel, so this is a huge step towards a lightweight material. With the hound parts, well, you see, we can also cut our total weight by 13.5 kilograms, because doors now also are made from aluminium, which is good. Bonnet, tailgate, as I said, well already made from aluminium, but now the doors also coming in aluminium, that has saved us 13.5 kilograms. So these can be added on top of the 22 that are already saved with the side panels of the roof. So in total, that is what 35.5 kilograms that we've saved in the body and white. That, uh, well, the total vehicle has lost. So also a warm welcome from my side. I'm Thomas Wolf. I'm responsible for aerodynamics of the new Cayenne. Like in Formula 1, we've got an active aerodynamic system, an adaptive aerodynamic system, with the adaptive radiator flaps at the front and at the rear, an adaptive roof spoiler at the rear. So let's start with the radiator flaps at the front. Here you can see what you have here is what we call in German the full closure system. We can close all of them completely. All 
all the air intakes where you've got cooling air coming in can be completely sealed or completely open. So with that, we can, of course, control airflow through the engine, compartment or through the car. With the preceding model, we only had a flap at the top. Now we've got flaps at the top and here underneath, underneath the bumper. And on the side, you can see we've got two systems for the intercoolers. Here, have a look at the adaptive system left on the right, because here we're for some using vertical flaps. So they will rotate on the vertical axis, which has a slight advantage, because only think, think at the air, the air streaming towards you, I'm there, it will, so to say, flow along the side of the car. So if the flaps are open, they only need to be opened by 45 degrees, and you will instantly have the full air flow through, well, the wheel arches. So full cooling of brakes and also full performance at 45 degrees. That's actually something we had patented because nobody else has it. The flaps are now fully adjustable, stepless actuation. Before that you had still stages and now they're stepless. And of course the systems are positioned bang in the middle because this is all about engine cooling. And of course the side ones, I mean that is intercooler. So these are separate, the lateral and the central flaps. Now, we move on to the highlight of the current turbo, KN. It's what we call the adaptive roof spoiler. To my mind, it's the first one, an active roof spoiler. I don't know any other SUV that has an adaptive active roof spoiler. We have it here. Now, this is where we start. It's closed. There you go. And by comparison, the entry KN S has got this fixed roof spoiler, not an adaptive, and only the turbo has this active roof spoiler. Of course, you've got this trailing edge to generate downforce, but it's constant. Well, if we want to reduce drag, we've taken this edge off, brought it 70 millimeters down, and of course, as you can see, extended the spoiler, quite a different position. So you can see the airflow just keeps going on. You can see what happens. We've got the spoiler here, the kinematics, the engines lifting it, and through these shafts, you can see the kinematic outputs are operated to move the spoiler lip upwards. Now the different positions, if we go at speeds below 160, it's the eco position, and you can see the spoiler is fully retracted. That's the position with the lowest drag. But if you go beyond 160k, as you can see the spoiler slightly extracts 20 millimeters higher, creates greater downforce on the rear axle, just as much as you need. This third stage is a so-called Sport Plus situational position that you manually select and here the spoiler will increase another 20 millimeters in height and if you want to go even sport your on the racetrack of course you get extra downforce here with that position of sport plus and i'll tell you something that you won't find in the press text now we've talked earlier about formula one and i mean you have the different requirements aerodynamic requirements at corners quick cornering speed on the straight line and low drag. And so as a speed of 250k, we are probably back on the race track. I'm sorry. So we slightly go down again to reduce track, but only a tweak, only a little bit. That means you are faster on a straight line. And if you fall below 200k, then the chances that we are hitting a bend, then the spoiler will extract again. So what you want to do is, of course, you will cut your lap times. It's much like in a Formula One. That's, I mean, it's an intelligent adaptive system. So there's a fourth position that I have not yet mentioned, and that's, of course, if you have it in combination with the panoramic roof. Because if you open the panorama roof, and you will see this in a clip in a second, what happens? Well, of course, you've got the windshield at the front, increases comfort inside, and they, of course, diverts the airflow. And that means the roof Spawn out the rear is at a disadvantage, and to compensate for that, it extracts still further 60 millimeters. And I mean, then you roughly have the downforce roughly of the performance, and this is, of course, suitable for any speed that you're going at. No problem. And you want or have to make a full emergency stop, then the spoiler will instantly shoot up into the air brake, 80 millimeters, and that gives you maximum downforce on the rear axle to keep you steady on the road. And for example, at speeds of over 250k, if you were to extract the air brake, that will cut the braking 
pass by about two meters. So two meters less in your braking distance at 250k is a word. And it will extract within 0.8 seconds to its maximum position into the so-called air brake. Um, and uh, just coming back to the flap at the rear, uh, it's an electric actuator that yes. we have there? Yes, with the gearbox. Yes, with the gearbox. Correct. Um, any significant advantages of using it other than the speed of operation? Mm, no, but it's sufficient to, to reduce... Uh, um, it's adequate to extract the spoiler at speed. That's why we have the gearbox. Absolutely adequate for a situation that we have. But of course, if the spoiler was to be much bigger, if the forces exerted on the spoiler would increase, we might even increase or use a hydraulic system, but it would be far too expensive and far too heavy to have a hydraulic system there. If it's bigger yes. and therefore great forces working. So this is absolutely adequate, the system we have here. Because in 0.9 seconds it will extract to full air brake position.